The end of every college basketball season is vicious and brutal and immediate, and it comes for all but one team. And on Thursday night, it claimed the Tar Heels. You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Friday, March 29th, 2024. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you've joined us at the place to get your Tar Heels content every single day. Yes, even on a tragic, sad day like this one. Special shout out to all you everydayers out there. Thank you so much for joining us as we have, as we called our live postcast on Thursday night, a therapy session. This is what we do after a terribly disappointing loss. This episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? You ever wonder what adventure could be waiting around the next corner? Why don't you take the Nissan Rogue or Pathfinder or Armada and go find your next big adventure? Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Well, as you well know, because you're here, North Carolina lost in the Sweet 16 on Thursday night, 89-87 to to Alabama. A very, very sad, uh, disappointing end to the season. So while it is Good Friday, it is not a good Friday. It's very sad Friday. So coming up on the show today, I want to talk about what happened in the second half, what allowed uh, Alabama to take over and win this basketball game, and then Towards the end, we'll have our four corners recap, our final one of the season, and the shady stat of the game, and then we'll get out of here. But I I, I do want to talk about the game. I truly do, and we will in a minute. And I did at length on our live postcast uh, on Thursday night. But for me, in the immediate aftermath of the loss the next day, it's critical to start nowhere else other than here. I am crushed. Now, not because it affects my health, or my well-being, or anything like that. At the end of the day, as Coach Dean Smith would often say, there's millions of people on the other side of the world that don't even know this basketball game took place. And so while I say I am crushed, I'm not crushed for me. Although I am very sad. Don't mistake that. But I'm crushed on behalf of this team. Because it's been such an incredible run. They had so much fun together. They turned around what last year was a completely non-Carolina season and gave us this beautiful season that we just experienced together. As Seth Trimble said, post-game, quote, of course everyone was ready for last year to be done. But nobody wanted this year to end. So that says a lot, end quote. And he's right. What a special and fun and unique team this turned out to be that came together, played for one another, played for the name on the front of the Jersey and played for Hubert Davis and all of us. And what a ride it's been. All these transfers that came in, man, they are Tar Heels through and through. Cormac Ryan is an absolute legend for what he did in the post-game press conference. Did you catch this? Like the, it starts off, it's, it's coach Davis and then Armando RJ Cormac, as, as you're looking at the screen left to right, as they often do, they opened it up for an opening statement by the coach. Coach Davis just kind of shook his head quietly. No. And then they started in with questions for the student athletes. Somebody asked Cormac one first, he took a while to respond and just really couldn't very much. Then Armando answered a couple, whatever. And then RJ was asked about his tough shooting day. And it was clear that the asker was just trying, you know, it, it wasn't, there's a way to ask that well. And it wasn't asked well, I thought. So RJ responds, I wasn't good enough today, quote. And then he said, quote, I missed a lot of easy shots that I normally make, end quote. And then as he's still trying to find the words to say, starting to wipe tears from his eyeballs, Cormac cuts in from the other side of RJ from outside the frame. And he says this, I got to chime in here. You guys can write whatever you want about tonight's game. You can talk about RJ. You can talk about the stats. You can talk about whatever, but we would not be in this position today without 
RJ Davis and Armando Baycott. Carolina wouldn't be in this position today without these two guys. So say what you want. There's just not a true fiber in your being that could actually believe that anything that happened tonight could be the result of something RJ did wrong because RJ's done something incredible for this team. He's done stuff that's never been done before. He's one of the greatest Tar Heels of all time. And for anybody to come and say anything negative about RJ is unacceptable. And I'm going to just say that, end quote. Cormac Ryan, this time last year, was a, a conference adversary, a conference foe who had just finished his last year at Notre Dame. And now... This dude is a Tar Heel for life, y'all. Do you get that? Here he is in, in the midst of one of the saddest moments of his life so far. And I, I don't know his whole life, but yeah, I mean, this is an incredibly sad moment for him. But here he is sticking up for these two guys that have been the pillars of this program for the last four and five years. Well done, Cormac Ryan. That's the kind of person that I want to aspire to be. Thank you for doing that. And that's what this team is. So sure, the, the, the wins have been incredible. The highs have been incredible. All the rides we've been on have been incredible. And they keep us coming back for more. But going back to the idea, we are crushed because we don't ever get to see this team ever again. We're crushed. Oh, it just hit me. Because Armando Baycott will never put on a Tar Heel jersey again. And he is Tar Heel royalty. Whether that Tar Heel jersey that he will never put on again finds its way to the rafters or not. He is Tar Heel royalty. And you will never see that young man play for the Tar Heels again. Armando postgame said, and I'm sorry if you hear the emotion in my voice, but I just, this dude has given it all for this university. Armando said, I'm definitely hurt. I've known Coach Davis since I was 14 or 15 years old, and knowing this is the last time I'll play for him, it definitely hurts. He went on to say, this is the best team I've ever played on. Just the amount of fun we had, the love we had for each other, it was amazing. It's obviously tough that we lost, but we played so hard, and we cared about each other so much, and we loved each other so much, end quote. Whew. Man, this team was something. We're crushed because we didn't want this ride to end, and it doesn't seem fair that it was cut short of where we expected it to go. And that, as we all know, is the agony and ecstasy of the NCAA tournament. Because when it's ripped away, it's sudden and it's instantaneous. It's like graduation, right? Where it's like you've been going and going and going, and you graduate high school or college or whatever, and then you like never see those people again, and it's all suddenly over. Same thing. There, there's a, a haunting finality to it that you can do absolutely nothing about other than accept it for what it is. There's no, no more, ah, we got to get back in the gym. There's no more, ah, we got to go fix this. There's no more, ah, we'll get that worked out at practice. It's done and gone and over. So we're crushed because Carolina went out not at their best. If you play well and you lose a close game, you tip your cap and say Alabama was the better team on that night. But if you play not up to what you feel like is your standard and you lose a, a two-point game, it feels empty. It feels so full of what ifs. What if RJ had made that dunk? What if or excuse me, what if Armando had made that dunk? What if RJ had made just even one three? And any of those kind of things with, with a multitude of Tar Heels. The what ifs eat you up, and that's why we're crushed. So let me encourage all of us that in this crushed state that we're in from Thursday night to Friday and heading into a weekend when you probably don't even want to watch the rest of the NCAA tournament now, in the immediate sadness that we've all just experienced, don't forget to remember the special moments of this year. And I'm not saying forget about how sad you are. Absolutely. Embrace that. But don't let it cloud what a brilliant team this was. And be thankful. Because I know that I am. 
Well, let's do get to the game itself. An un-Carolina-like second half was the Tar Heels' ultimate undoing. So, what exactly happened? Alabama dictated the terms. We'll talk about that in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode is brought to you by the Spring Cleaning Champions Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Clear out that winter bush with Manscaped Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code locked on for 20% off plus free shipping. Their fifth generation trimmer features two interchangeable next gen, next gen skin safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. So get the full grooming experience with Manscaped's signature Beard Hedger Pro Kit plus Handyman Electric Face Shaver. Because whether you're looking to craft your signature look or clean up that neckline, there's always the right tools for the job. Again, get 20% off and free shipping with code locked on at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with code locked on at manscaped.com. Not, nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. This episode's also brought to you by Better Together. Hey, is your bracket busted, but you want to stay in the game? I'd like to introduce you to Better Together, the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs over talent and you can play with your best friends, not against them. So pick more or less on real-time player stats. Strategize with your partner to boost your odds and climb the leaderboard together. Grab a friend and join the social DFS movement. Better Together also gives inexperienced players an immersive way to learn about DFS. Teaming up with and following the lead of those experienced friends and teammates in a team contest can take away the fear of diving in yourself for the first time. So Tar Heel fans, you need to show that you're the best players by participating in the Fan Challenge Series. For a chance to win real money prizes, see the app for contest details. Download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using promo code Locked On for a chance to win your share of over $1,000 in cash prizes. Play with me in a contest this weekend. Let's do it. Remember the code Locked On because winning alone is fun, but it's better together. After a promising, if at times uneven, first half, allowed Carolina to have an eight-point lead heading into the second 20 minutes. I expected Carolina to come out in the second half and extend the lead. Legitimately like, oh man, tough first 20 minutes for the Tar Heels, but this is where Carolina pulls away in the second half. Go through Mondo and things will be fine and you'll you'll extend that lead. Just, just Think back to last Saturday, what happened with Michigan State. Carolina survived that, that big lead by Michigan State early, that 12-point lead, got it back, and then just pushed it out as far as 17 points in the second half. No reason to think that wasn't going to happen again. In that game, Carolina showed their veteran, their disciplined savvy. And that's what I thought, and, and probably you thought was going to happen in this game. Sure, there was some fool's gold three-point shooting in the first half, but it's like, great, we rested on that in the first half. Now let's go to RJ and Armando and make it work in the second half. A little bit of Cormac sprinkled in some more Harrison or whatever it is. Great. But here's the problem. None of that's what happened, and Alabama dictated the terms of the second half. Here's several areas where. Number one, rotations. You look at the second half minutes. It's weird, right? Wasn't, wasn't Carolina-like of what they've typically done this season. You had Elliot Cadeau playing only five minutes in the second half. Seth Trimble, just four. Paxson Woldrick, nine. Coach Davis was actually asked about this in the press conference, and here's what he said. The way they were playing us defensively, they were laying off some of our guys. Pax is somebody that has always been ready when his number has been called. Somebody that throughout his career has the ability to shoot the ball from the outside. With them loading up on Armando in the post and loading up on RJ on any types of drives and them staying even more connected to Cormac after the first half that he had, putting in somebody that throughout his career is more proven from the outside would give Armando more space and RJ more space to drive and move. I thought Pax did a good job when he was in there. And I, look, I get that sentiment. They're sagging off Elliot, maybe off Seth. Great. 
And those guys d- availed themselves well in the first half. Each made two threes. But I don't just want to give up and let Alabama dictate the terms. I, I hear what Coach is saying. But when the offense looks so out of sorts, I'm going to go with my point guard and just just try it. Just see what happens. Maybe the point guard can bring things back together. Find better looks for RJ. Find the angle to get Armando a post entry. Find a good look for Cormac or Harrison, whatever it is. Again, I don't want to just say, oh, they're sagging off. And so now we've got to allow that to happen and dictate the terms. I, I would rather find another way. Punch back. Make a counter move. Just do something to keep switching it, whether it's some screens to get different guys the ball, you know, like as Elliot did when Duke sagged off him this year. He went and set screens for RJ, got RJ open, whatever it is. And my problem with accepting it is I feel like with all due respect to Paxton Wojcik, who hit that three, and I was so proud of him. But with all due respect, by allowing Alabama to dictate those terms, now you've got a lesser player on the floor in Paxton Wojcik and at times Jalen Withers instead of an Elliot Cadeau or a Seth Trimble. And I'm not saying they got to play the whole second half, but I'm saying that that led to Carolina, I thought, having to RJ watch for a good long while. So so I thought that that the rotations, I, I have second guesses about those. Number two, it, it certainly didn't help that Carolina was ice cold to start the second half. Literally, after scoring 54 points in the first half, they scored seven points in just the first in the first 10 minutes. So we're like at that point, like on pace to score 14 total points or 40 less in the second half. The first field goal took four minutes and 45 seconds to get to. I mean, it was shocking. Were you as shell shocked as I was? It was bonkers. And sure, there's got to be some credit to that for Alabama. But as RJ said post game, the, the Tar Heels were often just missing open looks, and there were plenty of them. In fact, in the post game, someone tried to bait Armando and RJ into talking about Alabama's defense, and I, I thought they did a great job. Armando s- deflected and said that it was really about Alabama hitting more shots and Car- Carolina just missing shots that they should be making, like chippies, and he said his own dunk, right? Same with RJ. He countered with, was asked about the guy that guarded him, and he said he's a good player. Good defensive player, but at the same time, I missed open shots that I usually hit. I love that he said the word open. They weren't draped on me. That was on me. I'm the one missing. And so it's just, there it is. Carolina just not hitting the shots, that ice cold. Um, And then you also had some uncharacteristic misses and some bad decisions down the stretch. We just talked about Armando's dunk. You know, he he had that issue a couple of times down the stretch of this season. I think there were, was it three straight games where he had a missed dunk? And then he had this one here. That dunk, had it gone, would have put Carolina up five with about six something to go. But instead, Carolina's still up three. And Alabama hits one of two at the free throw line. And the Carolina lead, instead of being five, is two. I thought, I just said it. I thought there was a little bit too much RJ watching down the stretch. Carolina did a great job. Uh, in that run of getting RJ the ball and he did it, but then it was just not enough ball movement. Um, obviously that we talked about it on the live postcast, but the Jalen Withers shot. And I know he was saying post game, like, Hey, coach is encouraging us to shoot when we're open. I get it. But at some point late in a game like that, you got to recognize time and score and know that this is not the time or place or score for you to take that shot especially with 15 seconds left on the shot clock. Like if you got to take that shot at the end of the shot clock, fine. But let's try to get the ball back to RJ. Let's try to get an entry pass to Armando, whatever it is. That was an unfortunate moment. And one of the ones that ultimately cost Carolina, or at least were part of costing Carolina a trip to the Elite Eight. And another thing with Carolina allowing Alabama to dictate the terms Alabama decided to keep in Grant Nelson when he picked up his third foul early in the second half. They decided to keep in a hobbled Nick Pringle, and Carolina didn't take advantage of either of those things. 
Grant Nelson's got three fouls. He's staying in. Let's force him to either foul or let us score. Instead, Grant Nelson's the one out there dictating terms, owning the Tar Heels. Nick Pringle. Yeah, I know Alabama's sagging off trying to crowd Mondo in the post, but you got to be able to find ways to get Armando the ball and let him go to work against a gimpy opponent that's out there. If they're going to put him out there, you got to take advantage. And Carolina wasn't able to. So, y'all, it, it just cannot be said how cruel the randomness of sports is. RJ had made a three-pointer in 41 straight games until Thursday. A complete and utter unfortunate time for the second worst field goal percentage that he shot all season long. He shot worse in the uh, Virginia game. And I, I, I received some comments or and have seen comments that RJ cost Carolina the game or that RJ shouldn't think about coming back for his fifth year. Come on now. Like I get that you're just saying that in the heat of the frustration of the moment, but nobody thinks that this is the ACC player of the year. Same thing. I, I'm not, I started immediately to see Hubert Davis is not the guy comments and I get it because I like, I'm second guessing some things too, but that's, that's my job is to second guess stuff and have this commentary, but I'm not going to the hot seat. He's not the man. No, 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 Please just in the heat of the moment. Let's, let's, let's not go to those places. I beg you, please, please, please. You know, again, the cruelness of the randomness of sports that Carolina would have an absolutely terrible second half of shooting 10 of 40, exactly 25%, but yet still only lose to two points against an elite offense. It's cruel and unusual punishment. And yet with all of that, I don't know about you. I still thought Carolina had made the run they needed to win this basketball game. There was that seven to nothing Grant Nelson run to put Bama up by five with 346 to go. And then immediately after that, here's what Carolina does. Jalen Withers layup. Great stuff there. I love his attacking the rim. It was awesome. Then that RJ floater, then two RJ free throws, both of which he made. Then two more RJ free throws, both of which he made. Suddenly from 346, now it's a minute and a half. Carolina's got a three point lead with 90 seconds to go. And I, it was like the Arkansas second round game in 2017. I was like, they've done it. They've like, I don't care how poorly the second half has gone. Carolina has rallied from that five point deficit when Grant Nelson was doing everything. And I thought it was over. And, and now they're going to get over the hump and win this game and go play Clemson in the elite eight. And then Mark Sears gets that layup and then the Jalen Withers three. And then the the Grant Nelson and one where Jalen Withers fouled him. And then Carolina, you know, RJ can't score on the other end, and that's it, and that's all. So I just knew, I just knew it was the Tar Heels time. Only it wasn't. Well, we've talked about that change from the first to the second half and what happened, but how about some stats to back it up? We'll get to all of that and more in the Four Corners recap and the shady stat of the game. The, fortunately, the final one of the year in just a second. Right after I tell you that this week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out. A team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. And that is those Clemson Tigers I just mentioned. Obviously, this week's Nissan Rogue. The team absolutely surprised us all with a powerful performance to get to the Elite Eight for the first time in, since 1980 and just the second time ever in program history in that win over Arizona. They say win life, go Rogue, and that's exactly what the Tigers have done here. So take the Nis Nissan Rogue or Pathfinder or Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Really is hard to believe that neither the Tar Heels or Arizona have made it to that alleviate game where we were talking about Carolina versus Caleb Love and Steve Robinson. Wild, wild, and wild how much RJ's shooting night and Caleb's shooting night paralleled each other. Really, really weird and eerie. All right, Four Corners recap. Number one in the Four Corners recap. You want an example of how Carolina's offense changed from the first half to the second. I mean, you saw it in action and you're, you, you at least felt like, oh, this is not as good as the second half. 
even though Carolina was getting all those threes up and making them, they were finding good shots. It wasn't like out of rhythm or where they shouldn't. Here's the number. In the first half, Carolina made 20 field goals and assisted on 14 of them. 14 assists on 20 made field goals. In the second half, Carolina made literally half as many field goals, just 10, and only assisted on three of them. That's a big part of how and why the offense changed. I thought as, as part of that, Carolina started to freak out a little bit as things were going awry and started just getting up shots and not working the ball well as an offensive unit. Again, I think part of that's you don't have your point guard in there, right? Um, RJ Davis did a great job, seven assists, one turnover, and there you go. Another statistical example, and this is still in point number one of the dichotomy between the first half and the second half, Carolina took 16 threes in both halves. By the way, for my money's worth, that's way too many. The Tar Heels should be closer to 20 than 30 every game with this team at least. First half, they made 10 of them. In the second half, just two. That's eight fewer threes in the second half than what they made in the first. That's a big change. Number two in the four corners recap. Something happy here. Harrison Ingram, man. I know it was not an overwhelming game like, the, like what he did against Michigan State, but still, 12 points on five of 12 shooting, two of six from three. Nine boards. He didn't get to a double-double in his last game of the season. Four offensive, five defensive. But in addition to those things, which were solid, five assists, zero turnovers, a block, and two steals. This dude just does so much to help his team play winning basketball. And I know they didn't get over the top, but it was not in my opinion, due to anything from Harrison Ingram. I, th I just thought in this game, he contributed a bunch in a bunch of different ways as he's done all season. I'm so grateful that he came to be part of this team. Thirdly, I talked about Cormac Ryan earlier, but what, what a postseason he's had in the NCAA tournament here. In this game, 17 points, 5 of 10 from the field, 5 of 8 from 3, 2 of 2 from the free throw line, 5 rebounds, 1 assist, 1 turnover, a block, and also two steals, just like Harrison. And what I thought was critical, you know, one of the things I had told you to watch out for is, hey, Cormac Ryan's been the fourth leading scorer in each of the first two games. So just watch for that consistency. Well, here he comes. He was the second leading scorer in this game. And, and, and it's just Cormac, just a steadying veteran influence throughout the latter portion of this season. And when all is said and done, Final stats are in. You know what his three-point percentage was for the season? 35.4%. He was going, baby. And I tell you what, I, I, I wish we could see what he and Harrison and everyone had done in the Elite Eight and hopefully beyond. Again, crushed. Number four in our four corners recap, rebounding. I said on yesterday's show that rebounding was a critical um, statistical thing to watch in this game. And it turned out that it truly was. Now, interestingly, Carolina did win the rebounding battle 46 to 43. But here's where the issue lies. They allowed 15 offensive rebounds for 15 second chance points for um, Alabama. Now, North Carolina had more offensive rebounds and more second chance points. But here's the thing. Carolina doesn't allow those. That's a season high in offensive rebounds for an opponent this year, 15. Now, I, I get it. It's a high possession game. So, you know, we need to look at the percentage of his percentages of it. Sure, I get that. I hear you. But I'm just saying, Carolina allowed too many offensive rebounds. And that's another one of those what ifs of like just three more points, you know, maybe two, three, four more of those offensive rebounds. Carolina had corralled them as a defensive rebound. You probably win. Shady stat of the game, the last one of the season. And unfortunately, it's going to be a bummer one. O of nine. For the first time all season, RJ Davis does not make a three. And that's in a game that the Carolina Tar Heels lose by two points. Literally one three. And I, you know, that's that's loosey-goosey. But one more three 
one three from RJ puts Carolina over the top in this game. Because I don't care how you win by one or 80. You win and you move on. Survive and advance is all too real. Oh, man, what a season, what a ride. It's over. I'm still recovering. I'm still shell-shocked. I got to be honest. It's back to the drawing board. Time to start over. That's the free agency nature of college basketball now. So I want to encourage you, stay with us throughout this offseason. For those who are new to the show during this college basketball season, this is literally, as I say all the time, a year-round show. I will be with us through the transfer portal, through uh, decisions to leave or stay, everything, football, all the off-season stuff. We're here all the time. We're going to have mailbags. Would love questions for you. Would love to keep interacting with you. So please, please stick with us. Let's keep having a blast. Let's come back together. Got circle the wagons and be a community when you're sad. That's the truth of the matter. But friends, that's it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. If you're not part of the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community, come join us. The link's in the show notes. It's free to join. Come for the Tar Heels. Stay for that community. If you're not subscribed on audio and video, please do that. Smash the uh, subscribe button right down there at the bottom corner if you're watching on YouTube. Also, hit the bell so you get notifications when I go live. Even though games are over, when there's big breaking news about transfer portal stuff or whatever, I'll still go live and then we can have those interactions together. All right. Even on a sad day, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. I hope you truly believe that and can still say it today. We'll be back again on Monday, but until then, peace.